And now that Karen has lulled us to sleep with those Christmas lullabies, the pastor's going to preach. No, I did that intentionally because that is our, our theme this morning, this idea of sleep and heavenly peace. You, of course, recognize what song that's from, right? Go ahead. I want to give you a second. It's one of the most popular ones. We sang it this morning. Well, we haven't sung it yet, but we will. Sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. What song is that? Silent Night, right? So we'll, we'll get there. This whole uh, series, we've been picking out lyrics from certain Christmas carols and talking about what Scripture has to say about them. Uh, so I was part of a conversation one time and heard this 19-year-old girl. You know, I go to work very early in the morning. This was back in September. She said she had slept one hour the night before. And this was probably, you know, 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. So me being the wise elderly statesman of the group, I said to her, you probably should have gone to bed a little earlier. And she said, I did. I went to bed at 7, but I couldn't sleep. And I thought, a 19-year-old girl who can't sleep. So then another young lady who was there saying, well, I didn't sleep at all. And then it became sort of a matter of bragging rights. You know, well, I've been up all night, and I'm back here to work today. And I was like, well, I'm not competing with you all because I go to bed early, and I sleep just fine until it's time to get up. So, But it's a common occurrence. You've probably heard people say that I go to bed, and I just can't sleep. I realize that now as I'm getting older... You can't sleep as well. You have to get up in the middle of the night for various reasons. People take pills. People have to go to the, to the restroom, all sorts of different things. And there's just, your body's not comfortable in bed. But I realize, so I'm not, I'm not uh, chastising those who don't sleep real well. But I'm talking about a different kind of sleep. Not because of turmoil and restlessness or whatever it may be, not being settled in our minds. Uh, but I want to talk about that this morning. But you realize that sleeping or not sleeping has a horrible effect on us physically. I was looking at some statistics this week. Somebody who wrote a book called Sleepless, a memoir of insomnia, said the world is divided into those who can sleep and those who can't. Uh, and that's probably a little, you know, it's probably a nice theme I figure book, but there is some truth in that. We even have movies. You remember a few years ago uh, there was a movie called Sleepless in Seattle. It was like a guy's response to like a midnight radio show, I think, and that was his, his moniker for calling into the show. He wrote an email or whatever it was. It's pretty old now, but sleepless in Seattle is what he went by. Is that I can't sleep at night. Um, some people have, uh, and I, so I get kicked out of something, some people have these intense getting ready for bed rituals. There's a million sleep aids out there. There's songs you can listen to. There's things that you can smell. There's, you know, dim the, they always tell you dim the lights and turn off your, your screens. And now even your, your phones and televisions have these little buttons you can click if you're going to go to sleep that takes out the blue light or whatever that, that makes you stay awake. Uh, so we have these intense sleep rituals. Yet there's still very, very few of us who, when that alarm goes off, don't want to hit the snooze button. Uh, there's very few of those people. I'm to a place now where I've gotten up so often that every day I wake up at about the same time. Uh, so I don't really even, and sometimes I'm even waking up early to see is, is my clock, oh, 15 minutes, that's great. Oh, five minutes, that's great. And I just lay there for that last five or 10 minutes. But anyway, according to the Centers for Disease Control, people that know about these things, uh, says most days or every days, they did a study in 2020, most days or every day, nearly 15% of American adults had trouble falling asleep in the previous month. And the result is that Americans, of course, report feeling sleepy an average of three days a week. Three out of seven. Either because they don't sleep well enough or because they simply don't get enough sleep. Uh, and there's some other physical things that talks about your glucose tolerance falls and your stress hormones rise when you don't get enough sleep. Um, it affects your weight gain, your anxiety. Uh, it affects your body's ability to fight infection uh, and sources of, all sorts of other things. Uh, but I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to a crowd that loves to sleep, right? And it's not like I've got a bunch of rowdy people here who said, I only slept an hour last night and would brag about that. We all, in this room at least, would love to get our sleep. Now, I don't know who's watching on video. Maybe there's somebody out there that needs to hear this this morning, but get to sleep. And I'm going to talk to us about that today. Uh, this study found that after uh, nights with the shorter than average sleep duration, the participants experienced, imagine this, a less positive mood when they encountered quite ordinary stress factors. So they didn't handle stressful things as well. I'll give you an example of that later. And they were also experienced smaller increases in positive moods from pleasant events. They don't enjoy things as well. 
It says, when you are sleep deprived, people irritate you more and things feel less fun. And God's people said, when we don't sleep well, that, that's just the truth. So we all need to sleep peacefully, just not right now. Now we're going to close with some songs today and try to lull you back into that place where you can go home and enjoy. When I grew up, we called it a Baptist nap because I grew up in a Baptist church. But we, you can call it a missionary church nap, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but there's, for me, there's always been something especially peaceful about a Sunday afternoon nap. Uh, now last Sunday, you know, I preached here uh, at 2.30 in the afternoon, which is prime nap time hours. Uh, so I'm not sure I recovered those hours at all uh, this week. But anyway, that was the goal. So if you need a minute to stretch or stand or whatever, I'll talk a little bit louder to make sure that we're all awake. But we're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 34. You can go ahead and turn your Bibles there. I forget what page number it is. That should be on uh, page 646 for you. Uh, in the Pew Bible. Um, so we want to dig into this text in Ezekiel 34, and perhaps the title is a little counterintuitive to what I'm actually trying to do, is Sleep in Heavenly Peace from the song Silent Night. Now, so I went back to look at the song, who is he intending to sleep? Now, the author might have intended, because the line says, uh, Holy infant, so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace. So he might have been encouraging that baby to sleep. But I think Scripture is clear that that kind of peace that allows that kind of sleep is intended for all of God's people. Uh, so look at here in, in Ezekiel 34. Now we have to admit, even as I got into Ezekiel 34, I'm going, okay, well, I'm talking about sleep. But admittedly, that's not what goes on in the book of Ezekiel. If you've never read the book of Ezekiel, it is a wild one. Uh, he's a prophet who's prophesying in Babylon. Uh, Judah had been taken captive, and he's, he's prophesying to that nation and he has all these wild visions, I mean, wheels spinning and things with eyes and all sorts of things. Uh, but there's a couple chapters in there that are extremely uh, peaceful. Like, it kind of breaks up like Isaiah. The first half is troublesome. The second half is pretty good. And we're in the second half of the book now. And chapter 34, God talks about the priests are ignoring you and not doing their job, so I will be your shepherd. So that's kind of the theme that comes into where we're going to pick up here in verse 25. So God is writing through the prophet Ezekiel, I will make a covenant of peace with them and rid the land of wild beasts. Now look what they are encountering that is robbing them of sleep. Uh, and rid the land of wild beasts so that they may live in the desert and sleep in the forests in safety. Verse 26. I will bless them and the places surrounding my hill. I will send down showers in season. There will be showers of blessing. Anybody recognize that song, right? Verse 27, the trees of the field will yield their fruit and the ground will yield its crops. The people will be secure in their land. They will know that I am the Lord when I break the bars of their yoke and rescue them from the hands of those who enslaved them. They're in slavery at this time. Verse 28, they will no longer be plundered by the nations nor will wild animals devour them. They will live in safety and no one will make them afraid. Verse 29, I will provide for them a land renowned for its crops, and they will no longer be victims of famine in the land or bear the scorn of the nations. Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the sovereign Lord. You, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, are people, and I am your God, declares the sovereign Lord. So as we read through that, we read the, this comforting sense that God has promised for his people who are caught up in this captivity. Um, but the thing that stands out the most is, wow, those are not really the things that keep me awake. Right? The things he talks about are wild beasts. They're in verse 25 and 20. Anybody in here not sleep because of the wild raccoons in your backyard? That's probably the only possible thing. But Israel was facing other things than that. It talks about wild beasts. It talks about a drought. Now we talk about drought, but it's a vastly less intense and serious drought than things that they dealt with in these times. Talks about fruitless trees in verse 27. Now I don't know about you, but they don't grow trees in my grocery store. I go in there, pick up the piece of fruit off the shelf, and there we go. I don't deal with that. Uh, it talks about enslavement and being secure in their land. None of us in this room are slaves, as far as I know, but that's one of the things that Israel's dealing with. It talks about verse 28, a plunder by foreign nations. We live in a country where we feel pretty safe and secure. We're not too worried about that happening to us. And verse 29 talks about barren lands and crops. So all those things that God is promising to deliver Israel from that are causing them this restless nights. And back in verse, verse 25, he said, and, and so that they may live in the desert and sleep in the forests in safety. 
Now there's plenty of places in Scripture, we're going to see a few today, where God promises peace and comfort and safety so that we can rest peacefully. Uh, but I wanted to go back to Ezekiel 34 and kind of contrast what the things that they face that kept them awake at night versus the things that, that would mostly bother us. And let's admit it, we haven't probably run into many of those things. We live in this prosperous, safe land of abundance. So if we aren't subject to those things that Ezekiel specifically mentions, what ruins peace for us? And the first thing that came to mind was what ruined peace for all of mankind is sin and evil in the world. That's the reason that there's even a lack of sleep on, uh, on our part anyway, because there's one universal thing that ruins peace for everyone. And the prophet Isaiah talks about it in Isaiah 48. He says, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. You've heard that phrase, there's no rest for the wicked? Well, that was the phrase that came to my mind, and I had no idea that that was a scripture verse until I looked it up this week and thought, oh, it's Isaiah chapter 48. God says, if you are, at, uh, if you are a wicked, evil person, you're probably not going to find rest. And that's the curse of all humanity. We live under this curse. There's no peace for us when we sleep under a curse. You remember the song, Joy to the World, talks about far as the curse is found, right? We'll talk about that, the song, Joy to the World, next week. But that line talks about the world, there's a worldwide universal curse of sin on all men, and that's what keeps us from having peace and sleep. But there's also good news in the scripture. We know that as followers of Christ, Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 says this. It's on the screen for you. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. Now what Paul is talking about there is the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and everything else. And if you can keep all of that perfectly, you're just fine. But if that's what you're trying to live by, if you think you can do that, you're kidding yourself. We have all tried and all failed at keeping the law. But God says there's still people who try to balance the scales in their favor. And he says all who rely on observing the law and balancing the scales are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of law. Unless you keep it all perfectly, you're loose. You're wicked. You're evil. It's not going to work for you. Someone wrote about this song, that the, the hymn, uh, Joy to the World, that talk about for as the curse is found. It contains this sobering realization that all is not right in the world, even at Christmas time. And there's also a prayer in that hymn that expresses hope that one day all that is dark and destructive in the human heart will give way to something that is good. And that's where ultimately we hope this goes. That's ultimately where it did go because, and Paul continues to write in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And it goes on, talks about his, his sacrifice on the cross. You see, sin in the world did give way to something good that allows us to sleep in heavenly peace. The good news about that line, far as the curse is found, is that that is not the first part of that line. The line actually goes this way. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns. Remember, that was part of the curse for Adam and Eve. Nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. So that, this line actually started with the, the, with the promise and the blessing, the forgiveness of sin. And then it says, for as far as that curse goes, it's already been covered by the good news. And God's people said... Ephesians chapter 2 said, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. This is the good news of the gospel. Spiritual peace is available through a babe in a manger, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the payment for our sins, and the, the forgiveness of God. And that's the beginning of ultimate peace and ultimate sleep. It's my prayer, my hope that we have all found that today. But let's acknowledge that we don't all sleep in heavenly peace perfectly all the time. Because there are still things, even though we have spiritual peace, there are still things that trouble us. Maybe not wild beasts and droughts and fruitless trees. But there are things like financial hardship. Anybody not slept because you didn't know how you are going to pay those bills? Or you just lost that job? Or one of your kids got in trouble and you don't know how to handle it? Maybe your parents are not as well as they used to be and you're wondering how we're going to continue to take care of them in the future. Maybe there's a conflict in a relationship or in your own family. Maybe there's substance abuse. All those things can cause us sleepless nights. Probably, I would guess it probably 
for all of us in the past month, there's been at least one night where we didn't sleep that well. Thinking about something or God speaking to us about something, sometimes there's a good reason for us not to sleep when God speaks to you about something. He'll get your attention. So what is a modern translation of this passage of Ezekiel was what I asked myself. I said, so if I'm not worried about wild beasts and droughts and fruitless trees, what am I worried about? And you have to answer that question for yourself because I don't know what it is that keeps you up at night. I'm not usually there. I was at work this week and there was a, uh, there was a guy working off to my left side. And this was my fault, I admit it was an accident, but there was a big package, a heavy one, leaning up against this post. And it's very busy, so there was like an assembly line, and one of the packages, this wasn't my fault, it was an accident, it had come off and made like a Lego shift, pushed all these packages, and pushed that big one over, and it fell down. Heavy made this loud noise. And I hear him yell out, and I'm like, uh-oh. Because if it fell on him, it, it could have hurt him. He was, he's even older than me, so I thought, well, that would have hurt me, so I know it would have hurt him. But I look, and it's in his work area, but it didn't hit him. Meanwhile, what I heard was, I don't remember what the first word he said, but I remember the several after that I can't repeat in church, nor would I repeat anywhere else. And he was so angry that he walked off. And I thought it had actually hit him and hurt him, so I was actually worried about it at first. And then I realized this is not that close enough to where he was to have hurt him. So an accident happened, a loud noise is made, the, the package goes into his area, and he throws a nuclear explosion and walks off with several expletives and swear words. And I'm like... That's where I really thought it had hit him because I was like, what is that about? I'm talking to other co-workers because I don't know him very well. I go, should I apologize to him? I didn't do it. It was an accident. And he, he was gone for probably five minutes or more. People are under stress. It's a busy time at work. And she goes, no, he just needs to learn how to act like an adult. And I go, okay, I thought it was just me. And there's a lot of nah, back and forth. And I'm just trying to be the peacemaker and all of this. And I wanted, to, I wanted to legitimately apologize if I had done something wrong to, to endanger this man. And then it occurs to me that I'm rem reminded as I'm continuing on with my job, I put the package back and try to make sure it's not going to fall again. I'm going, and I'm going to preach on heavenly peace. And I, here's the guy who needs to hear that. Because something small, a little minor accident, he wasn't injured, causes a nuclear explosion for him. I am thought, that's not a peaceful person. He's just ready to explode. Now, I've seen him do it a couple other times with other people. But I, I started to take it personally, and I thought, man, this guy needs to hear this. He's probably not listening right now. I don't know that he even knows that I'm a pastor. But I thought, talk about an example of somebody who's not sleeping and enjoying heavenly peace. Now, I realize also that I'm a pretty laid-back person, and I don't get worked up about too much. So I'm trying to factor that in with normal people's reactions. But even this other lady who gets worked up pretty easy, she said, no, he just needs to learn how to act like an adult. And I thought, okay, and he probably just wanted a break. I said, that. I thought that's what he wanted, you know, and needed an excuse. But I was, in that moment, I was like, here, this perfect example of me going to talk about what is heavenly peace has just happened of someone who's not experiencing heavenly peace. And you'll have to answer again what that is for you. Maybe it's family strife. I've mentioned a few things, financial troubles, worry, anxiety. Worry keeps a lot of people from sleeping. Maybe you watch too much daily news and you live in fear of what can happen. Or what's going to happen? Turn the thing off. What a comfort that we have in the Scripture, this promise of Scripture, that peace in this restless, noisy, troubled, hectic world. How many people can actually say they sleep in peace? Let alone heavenly spiritual peace. They need what Jesus promised. We've, we've studied this verse earlier this year, Matthew chapter 11. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened whether you're tired because you haven't rest or whether you've got burdens you're carrying extra stuff that you didn't plan on carrying come to me and I will give you rest take my yoke what I want for you to have take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls that's what Jesus came that's what he was concerned about for my yoke is easy. The burden I want you to carry is light. He also said in John 14, an interesting phrase. Jesus said to, I think he's talking to his disciples. There, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Here's the important phrase. I do not give to you as the world gives. Because what does the world give you? Not peace. Everything but that. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. 
What, what, how amazing must it have been to hear Jesus say those words? I wish I could get, I could speak the original language and hear the tone just correctly. Because, you know, a lot of times when we say things, they're just words on a page when we read scripture. We really need to think about how did he say this? Who's he talking to? What's the audience? What's the setting? What is he talking about in the big picture? And then in the midst of this, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Were they troubled in that moment? Were they afraid of something? You see, because sleep, heavenly peace and sleeping in heavenly peace or the sign that at least all is right with your soul. We have this phrase, sleeping like a baby, right? When we talk about innocence. We don't often use that phrase at Christmas, but a lot of our Christmas carols refer to Jesus sleeping in the manger and all those sorts of things. Because we think about babies because they're innocent and naive and peaceful, right? They don't have all the troubles and all the problems and anxiety that we have. They've just come into the world. They're fresh and innocent, and that's at least how we think of it. But if you've ever been a parent, you know that's one of the things that is not really a great way to describe babies sleeping because they don't sleep all the time for a long time. You're up in the middle of the night frequently with them. But we know that at least one infant was different, the one who was bringing spiritual peace to all of mankind, that holy infant so tender and mild, that that baby was the fulfillment of what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the ultimate promise we have of peace and hope. We live in a land of abundance and safety. We thank you for those things that we don't, we aren't restless at night because we're worrying about those things. But we know that there are many around us who are ready for a nuclear meltdown at the smallest thing. Lord, we pray that we can be people of peace as we go into uh, our workplaces, schools, uh, banks, libraries, whatever it may be, people that we encounter this week, may people see us as a person of peace, as your word says in, in Luke. We thank you for that promise from your word this morning. We thank you for the prayers from the psalmist of Psalmist chapter 3. says, I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O oh Lord. Make me dwell in safety. And God's people said, Amen. Would you please stand this morning as we sing?